Hello. Hey, Glenn. It's, uh, Hi. What's happening? Uh, I I looked up a little bit on uh, I did a Wikipedia search on on Sufi. It's like okay. esoteric schools, and uh, and they had like a, a big influence on I guess like other religions. Mm-hmm. And I really, <laughs> see uh, what they preach is like uh, because they 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 said they have non uh, Islam Sufis and then they have Islam Sufis. And what they teach is like a uh, something like um, it seems similar to what Alan's philosophy is, but uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it seems to be like um, uh, my, uh, my, I can't I can't remember it all. The important remember. thing is that it converts in French to the word enough. Oh yeah, uh huh, and, and and the word Sufi. I looked up the etymology of it too, and it said um, that it comes from the word Sophia, and I think that's in the Kabbalah, which yeah, means wisdom. it means wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Enough is um, the word one, mm-hmm. followed by U G H, and U G H is U, mm-hmm. genetic hen. And G-H is important because it comes at the beginning when they put them out of K-2 in the Himalayas. Oh, Himalaya. They're they're in (laughs) Afghanistan, G-H. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've heard you mention that in another talk. You said Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and Istanbul is like the center of all activity. They're all Istan, which is the phonetic word Nazi N A T S I. Oh yeah. Oh. Okay. And if you spell it use the letters differently, the word becomes Saint. And if you use it differently it's antis. So when you have the say the Democrats we're always the anti party against everything. Yeah. And uh, but the key word is tains, T A I N S. Pain is the back side of a mirror, and that's what Freemasonry is all about. Is that everything is mirrored? Yeah, I heard you mention uh, like the pyramid is basically yeah. almost like a diamond shape. I guess you could say like it's a mirror yeah. image. In the bottom of the pyramid. I guess that, that's the philosophy as above, so below, right? Yeah, just think of trying to build a pyramid on sand. If you didn't have an equal amount going down as you have going up, the thing would be falling over all the time. And that's basically the original pyramids were called step pyramids, and they all broke. You couldn't stand up. The minute you mirror what you have on top going down first, Mm -hmm. the thing is like a point in the ground and stuck there. And they hold their meetings, initiation meetings, underground. Uh, So there's, um, I looked up, I heard you also mention you said uh, the 90 degrees. And I see the ninety degrees in the the filfot or the swastika or whatever, yeah. and, and it's ninety degrees going around, and I guess that would make it three sixty going yeah. around it. But and I seen that in uh, one of the in Alan Watts book, he shows you the ninety degrees in Egyptian Freemasonry, and at the last one is the <laughs> gatekeeper of the troglodytes. Now this is somebody of this species, right? I guess communicating with. The troglodytes? Yep. Oh. The, the troglodytes just basically means people who live in caves. Oh, so it doesn't have to be a different species, just be cave dwellers. Yeah. They have to be cave dwellers. Oh. Not the concept that is pushed around in our world of cavemen who are kind of dull and stupid.
stupid and mm-hmm. walk around pulling a woman by the hair. <laughs> you know? These are people who have made their lives in caves. They operate in caves better than most people operate out of caves. In caves, you can build an infrastructure. So even if you were a cripple yeah. and and couldn't move around easily, you could build the kind of structure where you can sit in a chair that gets wheeled from one place to the other um, in a cave because that's build whatever you want. Revolving staircases and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I seen um I was also reading the book too. When you're telling me it's uh <laughs> that the Garden of Eden is also the room. And this is uh in uh in uh in Alan Watts book he says it's a Hebrew Aramaic myth. He said, there is a story of a world in darkness and a serpent moving over the deep. Way down under the water are Adam and Eve yoked together. The serpent dove down, separated them. This is a description of a spermatozoon penetrating an ovum, reaching the nucleus and fertilization occurring with splitting of cells. (laughs) I guess that's what you were saying. Is that, uh, I guess, what it is? What's that? One thing you have to remember about um, symbolic languaging, Mm -hmm. allegory, and and symbols is that on the one hand, it tells you what it is. On the other hand, it provides the spokesperson with deniability because Mm -hmm. everything could mean something else. Yep. So the English language is a lot like that. Yeah, and that's part of their religion. That's why they have plausible deniability, that whole yeah. law. You know, I guess a judge can interpret anything that he wants from the same stuff. You can have opposite decisions, and they do all the time. Yeah, I've, I've you know, I've heard too that, uh, that that's why they use the Bible or the Quran or any holy book in yeah. the lodge because that's their system. Oh. Yeah. And, like, and is that like a, a manual for the controllers too? Yep. Oh. Both encyclopedias and Bibles or, or any holy book mm-hmm. are, are basically manuals that uh, will give you answers to your coding structure without other people knowing you're looking at a code book. Because they leave them everywhere. You know, hotels will have yeah. a Bible in, in every room. So a guy coming in from out of town doesn't carry a code book with him. But he can hear something on radio or on TV, mm-hmm. and it gives them a hint about something in the Bible. And he goes to the hotel room at night, and he looks up uh, either by a word that was spoken or a number that was given. Mm -hmm. Uh, He has a set of rules that he's been taught, and they're different at every level. And it allows him then to go to the page, to the chapter, to the verse, to the words that he's looking for. And then he has to interpret what is meant by those words. Yeah, and those interpretations is different. How many levels do you think? Because I see it's always, you know, they have the, from what I can see, they have like a basically a interpretation for the masses. Then they have one for people, I guess, who are like initiated. And then there's the well, genetic it wouldn't, engineer. It wouldn't be surprising if uh, if the interpretation levels are based upon a a block number, uh, which could, in fact, be six. Every six, it changes. Oh, I, that that's, uh, that reminds me uh something else, too. It's, um, uh, I think it's from... Oh, yeah, can, can I still subscribe to your newspaper? 
I don't print it anymore. That's why it was, to me, the newspaper was like my diary while I was on the journey to find out what was really going on. Mm -hmm. So it was the, the first 10 of the last 20 years uh, I, I did the paper. And then once I knew what was going on, and I had the Desdemona typeface, and I could do the interpretation. Then I said, okay, that diary is no longer the way to go about doing it. The net is, is a better, more expansive way of getting information out and retrieving the information than having to remember which paper it was in and go find something by rereading over and over again every paper until you found what you were looking for. So uh, I stopped at issue 22, mm -hmm. and uh, issue 22 uh, meant that 21 were really the papers that I wanted. The paper number one was mostly a trial to get me started figure out what I had to do to do a paper. And I had other people helping me on issue number one. So a lot of the stuff was not my stuff. Mm, okay. And it became uh, obvious to me that I couldn't do it that way because the other people didn't want me to tell the truth. Why is that? Why is everybody, what's, what's so wrong with just telling it like it is or because they were involved in different aspects. As a matter of fact, the people I was dealing with were mostly from an Anglican background. Oh, okay, that's another. And, and Anglicans are basically the secular Freemasons since 1717. So they were trying to manipulate me. Like one guy said, you, you shouldn't write about history. You know, people aren't going to be interested in the past. They want to know about the present and the, the future. And I said, you know, that would be like writing the history of a skyscraper by starting with a description of the 10th floor and going up. <laughs> you know, yeah, you yeah. have to put the goddamn foundation in first mm -hmm. that people know what the premise of all of this is. Uh, but we argued and argued, and at the end, when we finally published the, the first paper, uh, I said, okay, that's it. From now on, I'm going to be publishing the paper, <laughs> and that's it. And they got mad at me. Do you know anything about the history of uh, the Ang uh, not the Anglican, the uh, Presbyterian? Well, it's it's the history of Protestantism. Mm. Every religion is a collector of money. Mm -hmm. And the money needs to be spent on things that people who donated the money would not agree with. So they create a protest movement within the church whether it be Sufis against the uh, um, Shiites, mm -hmm. uh, or it's uh, Protestants against Christians, or it's Buddhists against Hinduism. Mm -hmm. They're all a way smaller group than the original, but they do the things the religion wants done with the money. Mm. So they make secret societies. And these secret societies, because when I look at these religions, I, it's just Freemasonry to me. That's all it is, because they're all based on it. You see the rituals, and it's Freemasonry. Well, because the original Freemasons were priests. Mm. It was ecclesiastic Freemasonry. Mm hmm and how it came about was the uh, priests 
who were the Neanderthaler priests, they called them dog priests, Mm -hmm. they had slaves that they got by kidnapping little boys or exchanging material goods with uh, women for their little boys. And that's where you get the term, uh, like, uh, I think, widowed son, right? Yeah, they would bring them into the cave and, and say, this is my new son of the mother, Ma's son, Mason, Ma's son. And they would put them to work at expanding the caves and making tunnels and stuff like that once they got beyond the age that they were interested in them for sexual reasons. But at one stage of the game, it was decided that there would be a takeover on the surface of the Earth again because the Ice Age had diminished, and they went around choosing a group of these boys who would become their Uh, scouts and guides above on the earth and they made a deal with them if if you will work on changing human beings instead of working on changing caves we will free you and you will go on the surface so you have free my sons (laughs) free mod sons now All of the people who went on the planet were basically linked to the priesthood. So they were ecclesiastic, freed Ma sons. But in order to build a perfect slave, there is a day that's sure to come down the line that the person you want as a slave to infiltrate other societies cannot be raised in your world because your world is so different from the one you want to infiltrate. Mm -hmm. So you have to create a child that will be raised in the other world. The two Persons may have the same genetic engineering, but the difference comes with social engineering. It's the environment that you're raised in that is responsible for molding your character. Yes, I I agree with that. That's so true because um, even they know this in uh, behaviorism. Yep. That you can alter the person by altering his environment because they yeah. adapt to it. That's why communist countries took kids away from parents at the age of three or four mm-hmm. and put them in a kind of pre kindergarten kind of environment mm-hmm. so they could control much earlier than waiting on kids being sent to school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know. The, the first six years of a person's life are the most important in molding their approach to life. Yeah, yeah. The machinery may be the same if you're born in a cave or born uh, in a house. The physical genetic engineering of your bones and skull and all of that might be the same. But the very fact that you're raised in um, an environment with priests would make you a totally different person than if you're raised in an environment with a mother and father and a family. Yeah, uh, I've I've heard even like the Jesuits said that. They said that give me a mind, give me a child at seven and he's a mind for life. Yep. Yeah, and what you were saying earlier about the six levels, right here it says, I'm reading, it goes uh, seven veils in language. And the first was the common people's faith in the printed word. The second was the composite allegory of the initiated. The third is the reverse or mirror language. And the fourth was the Kabbalarian numerology. The fifth was visual symbolism or logos. And the sixth, 
the phonetic meaning in the original language. And then they have a seventh here that says Bacon's English language hieroglyphics. Yeah. That's all my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah I knew that. paper and you'll read it in my paper. Damn, man. You don't have any um, extra laying around you can send me, right? No, right? I can't give them away to some people and charge others. Uh, but if you came here, then you could have. All uh, right. I'll be seeing you in a little while. I just got to have a process I got to go through because yeah. I have a thing with uh, the Canadian government I have to take care of. But, yeah, um, yeah, I'm looking into, my, like, my genealogy. I, I, I can't go that far back, but... um. With my family, I know my great grandfather. He was a uh, he was the president of of Haiti, and and, and you know, he probably was like a, a, like a psychopath. Cause, I, cause I, from what I could, I could find, like he did uh, some. Hey, Haiti uh, was kind of like a halfway stop on the way to a prison colony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were like the first independent black nation. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's it's related to the French. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, just yeah. as my mother was, and I am, and and the French are different. Yeah, they are. <laughs> They're a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I know it's with the linguistics. I understand. Like, I don't know, maybe the way, because I think when you can understand different languages. Yeah, maybe different parts of your brain start working. Yeah. So, yeah. so I see that with, like with the French words. And stuff. Well, the 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 original language uh, of the French was Aramaic. Oh. And Aramaic became Latin, mm. and Latin became French. Oh. And the confusion comes about because English. Is 65% French and 35% from other languages. So the Latin and Aramaic and French are much more precise in their definitions. When they say something, they don't leave too much uh, play in there. Whereas English, that 35% allows you to play at anything. You know, I didn't really mean that. This is what I meant. Yeah. Cause it's, it's like, a, I think it's a dumbed-down language to begin with. Like, That's why they call it the universal language. <laughs> one voice, right? <laughs> <laughs> Going uh, in one direction, yeah. towards one. Oh, man. Uh, I mean, Tiger Woods wears it on his hat. One. <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, he's got the Nike sign, which means victory. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, man. And that's what, and I, and he probably was bred. He, be, there's no doubt about it. He, him and Michael don't Jordan. Don't get a Tiger Woods just by by allowing nature to take its course. Yeah. He is a golf machine. Yeah. Just like Wayne Gretzky was a hockey machine, and Lance Armstrong is a cycling machine, because it's you know you can. Uh, Teach Glenn Keeley how to cycle or how to play golf, mm-hmm. um, and I'll never be a Tiger Woods or a Lance Armstrong. There is nothing I could do in practice to make me like them because their joints were designed from the experience of measuring the joints of the golfers that came before them. Their their ability for things to swivel, or the guy, what was his name, Greg Lugasi, there won Olympic gold medals in the pool. Mm-hmm. Design for swimming. That's what you call task specific. So every task has a physical characteristic of a, the skeleton that makes it better than the average. So they analyze those things. They go and get, you know, the 10 best swimmers, find out what they all have in common, 
genetically speaking, and then they assemble that model and put it in an egg and bring that egg to term. And, and the father is assigned the task of managing that man or woman through a process of socially adapting to the task, and that becomes their entire focus in life. So they bring to the, the job the best body for that task, and they learn how to socialize into the best machine for that particular task. Mm. The whole idea, of course, is they don't care really about Tiger Woods or Lance Armstrong or people like that. Mm -hmm. The idea is these people will show what is the best a male can do. And then the job is to take that information and apply it to female because eventually the perfect slave, the one, will have a female appearance. Mm -hmm. and, and Jacques Rogue, about a month and a half ago or so on TV, said that he's the head of the Olympic movement. And, and he said, within the next 10 years, mark my words, within the next 10 years, females will be equal to male. Oh, man. So that's how close we are to getting where they want to go. Yeah, that's why they have the unisex. They just, yeah. they just want one. So the interior skeleton will be male, designed like, say, Tiger Woods, but the outside physique will be female because it can bring a baby to term and it has breasts in order to feed the baby. And it, has, um, it retains from the male one testy, that can inseminate an artificially produced egg that was made in a lab and sent to them in a glass bottle or vase. So they will take the egg out, insert it, their body will inseminate it, and it will be brought to term. And that way they can populate a rock out in the universe uh, using unisex-looking females uh, uh, that are, say, six foot one in stature and have the muscles of uh, Tiger Woods or Lance Armstrong um, and look like Sarah Palin. Wow. Doesn't that, um, when, you, when, you, when you know about what they're doing, we just, doesn't that, like, disgust you? Uh, well, it, it, it makes me uh, wonder... Uh, how long creation will allow this to continue. And I think we're in a race because creator is the hijacking intelligent designer, genetic engineer, whereas creation allowed creator to come about and hijack what he had put or she had put or it had put in place creation being a process rather than a person. And and at one stage of the game, creation will say, okay, we've had enough. You had your fun. Now, I didn't spend the last 13 billion years designing what I wanted in the universe for you to come around and change it in 60,000 years. Uh, so... Uh, your experiment is over, and I'm going to destroy the rock you live on. And there we all go. Our controllers and us can be destroyed overnight. Now, my task is to say, if that's the case, then shouldn't we make an effort at reaching out to these control freaks who want to manage the universe mm -hmm. and realize that a control freak is a control freak because they lack self-esteem. And can't we make an effort at making them feel 
that they are appreciated for their particular talents and they can join the rest of society while continuing to live wherever they want to live and we can work at this process of the future together as creation intended because otherwise we're both going to get destroyed as creation destroys creator we are the unintended consequence you know we're we're like the uh, gang running around gaza saying i'm not with hamas <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? wow well these uh, we don't even like f- from this you just know from a call like we don't know like the psych like cause this is a different species like we don't well, know. It, it's a different species in the sense that it grew up differently. Oh, but it's still creation. It's still. It came at, at the same time as the clan mothers. Mm-hmm. Basically, they're like twins who were raised in totally different environments. And not for a week or two, but for a million years or so. Mm -hmm. And they came back together in Africa, in the uh, Uldavai Gorge area, and uh, they went to a place, Djibouti, in in that general area, uh, on on the coast of the Red Sea, which at one time used to be the Red River there. And they allowed the ocean to come in, which made it into a sea. In any event, when they came back together, uh, if you want to see the allegory of that, mm-hmm. you watch the movie called Twins with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. Mm-hmm. Nobody would stop for a minute and say, how can these be twins when one's big and muscular, the other one's short and fat? That's what, when I watched the movie a long time ago when I was younger, yeah. uh, the twins, they were like, they were twins, but the one that was big got all the good parts of the the, yeah. the egg and the, the other one got like the leftover. And that's what the Neanderthaler's problem is. The Neanderthaler says, look, this is a partnership. I have donated everything I have, my intelligence, and have helped you to uh, make your life easier because you used to be a clan mother, a hermaphrodite, and you could only clone copies of yourself. I taught you how we could come about by changing some of your genetic material end up with two genders so that half of you could be the clan mothers and the other half could be task-oriented males and go about doing the tasks that support you. Now you have an easy life with all these people supporting you and you ignore me, the guy who made it all happen. I made the male by making the X into a Y. I broke one of the legs off of the X, and the Y chromosome came about, and that's your male. And you now have a slave, but you now ignore me. Mm. So the Neanderthaler began to say, if I can't be appreciated for what I did... I'm going to take power away from you. And the clan mother would say, you can't take the power away from me. You can't even get around. can't walk. can't do the things you need to do. And the Neanderthaler said, let me think about that. Eventually, what he came up with, I'm going to piggyback inside of the next eggs I make. And he inserted his DNA as the between brain or interbrain. 
He put his DNA so that the person who would be born, whether male or female, could no longer access the information in the gray matter in the spine without it going through him on the way to the brain. Oh, so we were more intuitive. Or... We were always more intuitive because the connection between the brain and the spine is needed. The brain can only reason, whereas the uh, the uh, library of past events mm-hmm. resides in the spine. So whenever a decision had to be made by a person, that person would reason things out, and then they would ask of their spine to send up confirmation that they were correct or confirmation that they needed to do more work on this because there was something they didn't quite understand. And that's done in that area called the interbrain where the bottom part is called the medulla Mm -hmm. and then it has a thing called the pons which is a bridge and at the other end of the bridge, there are like two divisions, and and it's like pulling reins to make the horse turn one way or turn the other way. If they pull on one side, the feelings that are created by the chemistry that come out of the endocrine glands are either positive or negative. And if it's positive, you say... I've reasoned this out, and I'm sure I have it right, and I really feel good about it, and I'm going to go about doing it. But if you uh, reason something out and you ask your intuition and it pulls on the other side, you feel, no, there's something missing here. I'm not really sure about this. So in comes the Neanderthaler, and he puts his slant on things in that area, and he says, okay, if what you're doing is following my will as a Neanderthaler, I will pull on the chains, on the reins that make you feel good. But if you're trying to do something that makes you happy and is against what I want, I'll pull on the reins on the other side, and you'll feel depressed, and you'll want to go to bed, and you'll get sick, and you'll be lame, and I'll do everything I can inside of you to stop you from doing things that I don't agree with. Like, what do you think, like, an example of that, like? A trinity. The definition of God, the Son, the Holy Ghost is basically that. You have the original... God the Father, Mm -hmm. and then you have, that's the spine, Mm -hmm. and you have the new one, God the Son, that's the brain, and you have the holy G-host, gang that wants to stick itself in the middle and change the direction. And if you go to any Mason Lodge and you look, there's a big G at the door. Mm -hmm. I thought it was uh, a generative principle. G-host and generative principle is the same thing. You're generating uh, your will in another person. Wow, so there's no there's no way to reverse it. There's no, like, people can't just have, like, self-exploration and just analyze themselves. There is a secret mm-hmm. that people can learn and the original interbrain that existed there in the past that did not work based upon a hard wired system it worked on the principle of sensors it felt what the spine had in mind and it made you feel what the spine had in mind. And antennas 
for a censor, go back to the time the first life of an animal was a worm. Mm -hmm. And on a worm, and it grew over time to be an eel, which grew over time to be a reptile, on those animals there were sensors. They didn't need to hear. They needed to sense, sense movement, sense of decay in the neighborhood, all of those senses. And in order to do that, the thing that picked up the, the sense was hair. So a hair is like an antenna. So at first, human beings were covered in hair. Mm. And we were genetically engineered to be from a hairy boar to a nice little pink pig. Oh, so you think the hair was like a like a reaction, like to against the like the part that they put in the spine to block that? It, it was, was a sensor that felt what the spine had in mind. Okay. And and you ended up with hair on your head. And the only people who could give the Neanderthalers a problem were the males of the species that that they separated because they were physically stronger. So they made sure that along the way, males would lose their hair. That's where male pattern baldness comes from. Oh, I see people get bald early nowadays. And for, for the purpose of assisting this process, for those that wouldn't become bald, they made it a fact of their religion that they had to put their hair up and cover it with a hat. And in, of course, time, that evolved into a turban in the East and a suggestion that men should have short hair so they would cut their hair. But the wise men who were judges in court were made to wear wigs because that was a symbol that you were a complete person you had access to your intuition, although mm -hmm. it was phony hair. It didn't work, but it, it was a symbolic thing. So the, the thing to remember on this mm -hmm. is if you want to access the information called intuition in your spine, mm -hmm. and by having lived a long time from the beginning of mankind at, say, about 200,000 B.C., that's where the um, archives are, is in your spine. You can no longer access it internally because you've been genetically modified to impose upon you the will of a Neanderthaler. But if you let your hair grow, and hang freely beyond your shoulders. It's like a radio antenna looking for signals from the spine. And it circumvents the Neanderthaler and brings information into your head so that you can then go through the process not only of having reasoned things out, but also to confirm it through your intuition. I've been doing that. I've been growing my hair for over over a year now. It's like really, you know. It takes you know. about three years to get it past your shoulders. So yeah. yeah. Normally. But see, black people are more likely to know more things because they go back further on in time, having been the original people. So they try to impose upon black styles that will defeat this purpose. An Afro haircut, for example. The hair points upwards instead mm -hmm. of downwards. And these little curly things that uh, um, all that uh, group of 
there's a religion that people. Oh, like the Jewish with the little curls coming down the side. Or? Yeah, but blacks. Oh, for black. Um, Jerry curl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, as soon as you you curl it, mm-hmm. you're taking away its ability to uh, to in fact act as an antenna. How about if you braid it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's what if I you do. braid it, the same thing. If you make it in even in a ponytail, uh, it it basically limits its ability because it's all stuck one on top of the other. It has to hang freely. Well, well, you said the afro, the, the hair grows naturally like that for black, black no, for black people. It doesn't go down to your shoulders. Well, they they basically assist it by spraying it. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Modeling it, that kind of stuff. So they, that's that's the idea. In the Bible, they they give you that as an allegory when they say that. Samson lost his power when Delilah cut his hair. Obviously, by cutting hair, your muscles don't become weaker. So which power did they lose? They lost the power that they used to have of intuition. Uh, intuition. So, and I, Read the word. And, and they put that in the matrix because the the you mother paid, of the matrix you paid your fees. Uh-huh. It's in your tuition. Wow. Uh, yeah, like the mother of the matrix had all the intuition. Yeah. She had the foresight. Yeah. Oh my God. It's because there is gray matter mm-hmm. in the spine, in the same way as there is gray matter in the brain. The difference is in the brain. It's active for the purpose of calculating reasoning, whereas in the spine, it's uh, passive because it's it's like your storage bank. Yeah. Now, if you can't ever retrieve things from your storage, uh, then you can't do the cross-checking that you need to do. Think Think of somebody wants to design a bridge. Mm-hmm. You you basically design a bridge, and then you say what the normal conditions are in that area as far as traffic and as far as uh, as wind conditions are that type of thing. Mm-hmm. But if you have nothing to to test it against, whereas with a computer, they have put into the computer for people who design bridges, all of the bridges that have ever been built, the designs. So you you then say, okay, I've designed this bridge. Is there anything like that in the past? Anything that has similarities in, in the length of span or in the width of span and in, in the winds in that area, that kind of thing. What would happen if I built my bridge? And the computer will say, hang on a second, I'll go check. And it looks through and comes back and said, in in 1908, there was a bridge uh, that was built similarly to the conditions you've described over the St. Lawrence River between Quebec City and Levy, and it fell down. So I don't think your bridge that you've designed is the right design for that location. Mm. That's what the spine does. It tells you about the past. It adds that to your decision-making. Without that, everything is new. You have no background material. Check it out again. And you have to live the trial and error phases all over again. The beauty about an archive is you don't waste your time with things that have proven in the past not to work. But if you don't have an archive, everything's trial and error. And the elite, they they have 
you know, on the grander scale, like archives of history of the world, they call it the the wisdom of the ages. They have all, and, and I think like okay, since they're like higher slaves, why don't they just they can always revolt or something? I mean, they have all the power in the world in this material world. Well, they have revolted. That's what they're doing. They've revolted against us. Oh. Uh. Because we didn't give them the accolades they thought they deserved. And they said, okay, you don't want to pay attention to us? We're going to piggyback inside of you and make you feel bad every time you're doing something we don't like. So you'll feel depressed. And you won't want to go and and work on your project. You'll want to stay moping around doing nothing. You won't want to read. You mm. just feel bad. But not that part of the training too at school? Because they really drive it in, you know. Yeah, but nothing is better than having someone mm-hmm. spying on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> that was the the reason they designed marriage as an institution, because by designing marriage as an institution, they were then able to make a certain task-specific slave that would be handed over to the enemy to be their spouse, their wife, and that person would spy on their husband and hand the information over to the family. The story of Esther uh, in, in the Bible is the story of a Jewish woman who is married to the king of Persia, and he's planning a war against the Jews. Mm -hmm. And by informing her family uh, about this possibility, uh, her uncle Mordecai comes in and and speaks with, with the king and gives them information about things he never had before to the point where he is then appointed prime minister and the Persians don't attack the Jews. An insider is called an arranged married, an arranged marriage, a female being told by her parents, you're going to go live with that person and you're going to send us back information. Now, That was fine as long as it involved royalty because they had all of the funds and everybody else was poor. But when democracy came along Mm -hmm. and the middle class grew, there were no women who could be sent to live with ordinary people who were not royalty or priesthoods. So that's why they designed what we call secular Freemasonry, Freemasonry outside of the priesthood. Mm. And that was done in England so that it... Oh, it's modern Freemasonry. Yeah, Yeah. it could be married up with democracy Mm. so that all the corporate heads out there and all of the prime ministers and presidents who were elected uh, could be sent this spy woman, who's not a woman but a Neanderthaler, to live in with them. And, and if you look around today, the best example is the president of France has got a woman living with him, calls his wife, whose name is Carla Bruni. Car la, mm-hmm. la female car, a vehicle for the brown, Bruni, brown one. So she's the same as Eva Brown was to Hitler, the mm-hmm. spy inside. Wow. And brown comes from is tan. Pak is tan, Uzbek is tan, Afghan is tan. It's tan. 
the ultimate color of a slave mm-hmm. is to be a mixture of black and white. And the halfway point is tan. And the tan is a ten. So as you develop the person, number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up to six, you're different. At seven, you're altered. Mm. At eight, you become a two in one, two balls, one on top of the other working together is an eight. Nine was put there temporarily and is no longer needed because it is an image of the six. It's the equilibrium. And therefore, after eight comes ten. That's the time we're at right now because they've eliminated the symbol of number nine, which was Pluto. And in the cartoons, you have two dogs, Pluto and Goofy. He's a, he, cause he's so he's an idiot because he's followed from the sun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. I I noticed they used the numbers because first, you know, that's what the five elements are. You know, it was it was man. Yeah, oh, six, you could, but now we're going nine. from five to the six, right? It's the six. Yeah. The six. Six the, and nine are are the same number flipped over. Oh. And if you put them together on a flag, you have the flag of Korea. <laughs> and it's the symbol called equilibrium. Is that is that the same thing as the yin yang too? Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> That's the hermaphrodite. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> Plato Plato talk you know, I brought this up to Alan about the one book called Timaeus where Plato talks about uh Atlantis and and I and I asked him about the validity and he said it was just a system they were talking about. System. Plato, just the word Plato. Eight O. Eight O. <laughs> yeah, eight O, but the first letter is P, which is a six or a nine. Depending on whether you flip it up or down. Mm. There is no L. You know that, eh? Mm-mm. They tell you every Christmas. No L. <laughs> oh, man. No L, no L. <laughs> it's crazy how you can train people. But, and I always thought it meant, you know, I didn't always think this, but I recently learned it, it means like sun god, because L is the old, I think, Semitic term. Yeah, it's Leon backwards, and it's another word for lion. Oh, yeah. There is no lion. The lions, lions den, London. Yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's now female. Man, oh man, these guys are. This is and a. It's like a perfect, perfect system. Well, they they had a lot of time to plan. Eh? The, most of this planning was done from twenty four thousand BC mm-hmm. to eight thousand BC, which. They had nothing else to do. There was an ice age going on up there on on the surface. So they sat around and played with their computers, and they came up with 6,000 different languages from the same phonetic base. And they then decided on what would be the appropriate codes so that they could speak words and not be understood. And... uh, Then by 8,000, they began putting the thing in place. At about 13,000 B.C., they sent out a few investigators, scouts, to look at the different places, how long it would take for the ice to disappear from North America, for example, or from, from the Nordic countries in Europe. They were all planning that. They they were doing investigations of where the coal seams were across the northern hemisphere and what areas they would have to bridge if there was no coal between one place and another, but they needed to have uh, some method of transferring the energy from one place to the other. In the U.S., they built underground silos for the purpose of defending against nuclear war, stuff like that. But what it does is basically link all of the areas together 
that were too far off the track uh, when you're trying to destroy the thing using the principle of ANOVA. Mm -hmm. Now that all these things are in place, they have what they need, space for the earth to collapse. Mm -hmm. No aquifer, mm -hmm. you build a tunnel. That's what they always were telling people. Like, I was, I remember watching, uh, I watched the whole series of the Planet of the Apes. They had a whole bunch of episodes. Yeah. And they show episodes of underground people who live and they worship a nuclear bomb called Alpha and Omega. <laughs> it destroys the planet. Yeah. It's all these little any windows. you got to remember that the most powerful explosive you can get is what starts a volcano. And it's called acetone. Acetone is the end product of putrefaction. The best way to make acetone is to have a vineyard. And the waste from grapes becomes wine, ferments into vinegar, and turns into acetone. When it hardens up, it is known as plastic explosive. Mm. So by itself, it's not volatile. Conditions need to occur to turn it into an explosive. The first condition is it must be surrounded by water. And the second condition, there must be a spark. So what do they do? When they were deciding how to build America, they send the priest, the Arabic priest, from Mallorca to Mexico, and they come up along the coast, into California, setting up a uh, railway of uh, vineyards around churches. And they build these 13 vineyards in California, these Spanish monks. And what you now have is the end result of 300 years of growing grapes is in line underground on this track of, of uh, monasteries that are really covers for vineyards. When the water comes onto that area, when it floods, it will have created the circumstances necessary for an explosion, but will be short the spark. The spark will come from an artificially induced collision of particles underground through a particle accelerator. The particle accelerator will cause such an explosion underground that the mountains will cascade. That's what they call them, the Cascade Mountains. Mm. They will turn over, and the mountains will become mud, and that spark will light the coal seam, and the coal will begin to burn underground and burn all the way across the United States up until it reaches Nova Scotia. And as it burns underground, it will spew out on the surface fire and brimstone. And the fire and brimstone is like fireworks exploding on the surface, lighting new fires, creating new smoke, more greenhouse effect, causing spontaneous combustion in other places as it all dries up. And by the time it's finished, there will be no land in 
that area from California to Nova Scotia in Canada, and the thing will just keep churning and collapsing, and that's the definition of a, a nova, and that's why they call it Nova Scotia. Mm, and that's and going and back that and... moat mm -hmm. across the North American continent will continue and repeat itself in Europe, Is that... always going to the closest big lake. So the Mediterranean becomes part of the network, and then the Caspian Sea and the Aral Sea, and so it'll be working its way across to a point where you're going to have the equivalent of black water or quicksand where there is land today and mountains. Those mountains will have disappeared. Even the Himalayas, as it goes by, will all be churned back into quicksand. And the space in the northern hemisphere from the 8th to the 53rd degree latitude north mm -hmm. will be a moat. A moat of B, right? <laughs> so moat it be. Uh, and that moat uh, will mean that another law of physics comes into play. It's called isostatic. The law called isostatic says that on a planet with continents, there must be a static amount of land above water to the land that is below water in continental shelves. So since the United States and Europe and, and Asia will have gone underwater, then the northern part beyond the 53rd degree latitude, which is at about the middle of James Bay going towards Hudson's Bay, uh, will have to rise. So one part goes down in the northern hemisphere, the other part rises. So where the Canadian Shield is today in our area, it's uh, a thousand feet below my feet, the Canadian Shield will rise to be the surface. And that continent of the north mm -hmm. will be like a cap, the same cap as worn by rabbis and, and by the pope, with one major difference, two major differences, is that it has visors. It's not a perfect 53rd degree circle around the planet, but it has two dips in it. One dip is here in eastern Ontario, coming to the St. Lawrence, is one visor. And the other dip is on the other side of the planet, going down into the uh, Mongolian Plateau and Gobi Desert. So that the eventual shape of the Cap Continent of the North will look like the hat worn by a famous fictional detective. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> her lock home. She locks her home hmm. in the north. And 1,000 years later, a similar kind of activity will happen in the southern hemisphere, which means they get an extra 1,000 years to double-check all of the measurements and, and equations and scientific formulas. And then they go through the same process. Is that what they meant about with a 1,000 years? And yeah. To, oh, 
to me. That loads. means this planet is going to have two caps. One is Antarctica, mm-hmm. and the other one will be the new cap at the North Pole in the north. And right now, there is a battle going on between Canada, Alaska, Russia, uh, the Nordic countries, Greenland, Iceland, to plant flags in the north, because that's the only part that's going to survive. And although it has the largest natural resources possible, in those areas, the governments are told not to allow any more exploration. Like when the uh, Republicans wanted to build new pipelines to Alaska, Mm -hmm. they were told no. And the Democrats took power and stopped any of that activity. The Canadian government has access to the largest oil reserves in the world. They're called the tar sands. Right, sons and of the they rat. only oh. scratch the surface. Mm-hmm. You know, and say, oh, it's too expensive, we can't do that. And as the minute they want to do a little more, mm-hmm. then you have a credit crunch. And you have a drop in the price of oil so that There's no incentive to pursue it. It's all because it's made to be kept for later. When the cap continent is in place, it will be its strategic reserves or its operation. So both caps at either end will rise. There will be a warming of the planet and therefore what will happen is they will be clear of snow and they will both be agricultural areas at either end of the continent. They will have, in fact, done physically to the rock called Earth what the media does to people. It polarizes people into two camps, Mm -hmm. one for and one against. In this case, the Southern Hemisphere camp is the home of the controllers whose activity below ground will have its its, uh, presence known above ground in Antarctica as it returns to the green areas. So they will have a divided continent based upon three basic rings. They are the center ring, the Neanderthalers. Mm -hmm. They will have a bureaucracy in a ring around them separated by a moat who will service their every need on a daily basis. And there will be a third ring around them on the outside who will in fact be the communicators back and forth between the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere to bring back what the northern hemisphere has claimed as taxes on other rocks in the universe as they terraform, first of all, the solar system and eventually out into the universe. That is If allowed to take place, this is what is intended to happen. The question is, how long will creation hold back before it destroys it? And is the destruction to be basically a mirrored image of the Big Bang? In other words, a big crunch. And has it happened before? Is this a universe that has followed the destruction of a universe in the past 
And is this a universe in transition to a future universe in the future? After our friends, the Masons, have had their little game and caused us all to be destroyed. Oh. They have like, it's just, it's just a game to them, right? Yeah. In other words, I'm in transition right now. I got to get to the barn and see <laughs> the animals. All right. Yeah, I I I want I definitely want to get up there cuz yeah. You it's said, cold uh, and they need food. They need energy to build some internal heat. Hopefully not enough that they blow up. Uh, are you, are are you, are you, are you um still uh looking for the stone? Oh. Yes. Oh. Except you're limited in your ability to do it in the winter time. Yeah, plus the snow up there. Yeah. It's crazy. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks. Talk to you.